Um, hello again, everybody. Um, and uh, to those who just joined us, uh, welcome uh, to this second um, lecture in the winter 2020 series of the Alir the Ahmadian Lectures in Iranian and Persian Age Studies. My name is Mustafa Abedini Fard, and I'm uh, an assistant professor without review of Persian literary culture and civilization in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC. Um, uh, again, this is the second lecture from the series, and these series were named in 2019 in honor of Ali Reza, a beloved former student and member of the Canadian Iranian community. Um, I'm very excited about uh, our speaker today, um, uh, but before introducing him, uh, I would like to mention a couple of points. Uh, so we're recording this session, so those um, who don't get a chance to watch it will be able to watch it later on YouTube. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please um, save them uh, and mention them basically in the Q&A box um, so that the speaker can um, respond to them uh, after his lecture. Uh, I would like to acknowledge <clears throat> that UBC Vancouver is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Moschium, Squamish, and Salai uh, Watuth peoples. Um, and now um, our speaker today is Dr. Amir Hussein Abafa, Assistant Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Shiraz University. We're honored to have him joining us from Iran. Um, he's the author of Recasting American and Persian Literatures, published by Paul Grave in 2016. Amir Hussein's recent research has been twofold but intertwined to read English literature as a non-European participant in Anglophone literary studies, and to decolonize the canon of modern Persian slash Iranian literature to unlearn and recast the modern slash colonial history of the Middle East region. Um, I am very excited to um, hear um, Amir John's talk and to learn from him, especially because he will be talking about a rarely discussed uh, work. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Amir Hossein Abafa. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa John, for your very kind introduction. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this morning in Vancouver, this evening in Iran, uh, for the second Ali Reza Ahmadiyan lecture in Iranian and Persianate studies at the Department of Asian Studies. University of British Columbia. So the title of my talk, as you have realized so far, is No Heaven for Gangadin, from speculative fiction to decolonial option. So uh, when I returned to Iran a few years ago to begin teaching English literature at Shiraz University, I was determined to help my students make sense of their education in a world of global interdependencies. Having had completed my postgraduate studies in post-colonial Malaysia and multicultural Britain, I was well aware that to teach English as a global language and globalized culture in the face of the political and environmental challenges on our planet requires a full recognition of one's worldliness and historical situatedness, one's global awareness and political consciousness. This is particularly the case in the modern Middle East and Iran today where global English as an imperial language has been in circulation since at least the 19th century. What I soon realized, however, was that English literary studies in contemporary, contemporary Iran had remained out of touch with the recent developments in the discipline, resisting the tides of change, ranging from the comparative and the transnational turn to post-colonialism or the opening up of the literary canon to mark the advent of multiculturalism and globalization. Notably, in the early stages of their encounter with modernity, some Iranian thinkers viewed European literature as a medium of reflection upon the self and the world. In Sargozashte Hajib Babay Asfahani, for instance, Mirza Habib Asfahani would translate 
James Moyer's oriental novel, an English bestseller in the 1820s, to recast the democratic possibilities of the Persian language at the dawn of the constitutional revolution. Yet in contemporary Iran, as I have argued elsewhere, the academic institution of English literature as a secular branch of the liberal arts is in a crisis of legitimacy. It is religiously Eurocentric in a passive aggressive reaction to the nativist ideology of the Islamic Republic, having thus lost the creative capacity to produce knowledge that is compatible or competitive with its counterparts in the Anglophone world. Reminiscent of Thomas Macaulay's dreams of a proper colonial education, the curricula in my own department has for decades celebrated classics of English literature without much critical or comparative hindsight. Ironically, in a post-revolutionary context that sought following the so-called cultural revolution in the Farhangi of the 1980s to decolonize the humanities. Azar Napisi's memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran, which needs no introduction to the North American audience here today, may in fact be read as a telling account of the state of English literary studies in contemporary Iran. In four parts, each named after a canonical author of Anglo-American literature from Vladimir Nabokov to Jane Austen, a professor of literature and her students in Tehran read the classics to, on the bright side, address their predicaments as Iranian women in the face of gender discrimination. Yet they do so without accounting for the processes of canon formation through which the texts that they study came to embody the universal ideals of liberty or acquired cultural hegemony in non-European contexts like Iran. Please forgive me for this lengthy introduction, but it provides the right context for the story I am about to tell. Three years ago, during a lecture on English prose, I had an epiphany when one of my students told the class about a discovery he had just made at the university library, an understudied text by an obscure author. Now, if, if I may have the next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ali Midrick Vandy's novel, No Heaven for Gangadin, the British and American officer's book. A novel written in English during the Allied occupation of Iran in World War II and published in London in 1965. The peculiar history of this text and the more curious case of its author is the primary focus of my talk today. What struck me most at the time my student told us about it was that I had never heard of Midrick Randy, much less know about the book in the library of the university where I teach, where I did my own undergraduate studies in the early 2000s. How comes this novel, the first work of Iranian literature in English, never found its way into the curricula when I was an English major or into my own syllabi when I became a teacher? Next slide, please. The answer lies not only in the entrenched Eurocentrism of my English department or the coloniality of knowledge in post-revolutionary Iran, but also in the text's own alterity, its self-proclaimed sense of otherness. Written in the thick of World War II, No Heaven for Gangadin is an allegorical and deeply intertextual work of speculative fantasy and science fiction, which broods over the hypothetical aftermath of World War III in the distant future. In the course of the narrative, the central character, Gangadin, named after Rudyard Kipling's famed character, an eponymous poem of 1890, to which I will return, 
accompanies a group of American and British soldiers towards heaven across the Milky Way galaxy. As we follow Gunga Din in his Star Trek, his cosmic journey, I suggest, leads to a re-examination of modern Iranian history and its global entanglements since the advent of Tajadot or colonial modernity. There, on Midrak Fandi's alternative world map, I hope also to rethink the implications of literary and cultural studies in Iran or about Iran. Next slide, please. Ali Midrakvandi was a rural laborer from the region of Loristan in Western Iran, who escaped the famine that struck rural Iran in the aftermath of the First World War. In the introduction to the novel, Midrakvandi relates the extreme poverty and dilapidated condition of his family in a village named Rehan, where they stood, where they withstood the cold of winter without proper clothing or any supply of wheat. Wandering in search of employment to Tehran, Ahlaz, Khoramshar, and back to Tehran again, Ali ironically faces the outbreak of yet another international conflict. Just after the Allied occupation of Iran during World War II, he finally lands a job as a servant to a regiment of British and American troops stationed in central Tehran. What is significant about the historical backdrop of Midrash Fandi's work is the impact made by global events, namely the imperial expanse of two world wars on the precarity of life in early 20th century Iran. In Tehran, under the command of Major John Heming, who later helped with the publication of Ali's work in London, and who also appears as a fictional character in the novel, Midrash Vandi grew an interest in English and began learning the language during his tenure at the camp, poring over dictionaries and corresponding with his employers. By 1944, Ali had not only mastered the language, but completed two manuscripts in a distinctly broken, but biblically concrete English. The first one is called Nurafkan, a long epic in prose, which remains unpublished in the archives of the Bodleian Library at Oxford University and the British and American officer's book published by Victor Golands as No Heaven for Gangadin in 1965. The novel is not only the first work of world Englishes written, if not produced in Iran, it is also, despite having been thoroughly understudied, one of the pioneering, pioneering works of speculative, if not generically science or fantasy fiction in modern Iran. One can perhaps think of uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul Hussein Sanatizadeh's Rostam in the 22nd century, Rostam da Garnebi Sudovom, uh, or Sadeh Khedayat's uh, Forefathers of Adam, Pedaran Adam, as well known attempts at the genre in Iranian fiction. But Midrak Vandi's work, which is currently excluded from the canon, is, is far more speculative in terms of reflecting on the global entanglements of and implications of colonial modernity in the Middle East region. Next slide, please. The plot of No Heaven for Gangadin is set in the year 2084, perhaps unbe unbeknown to Midrak Randi, a century after the events of George Orwell's 1984, in the immediate aftermath of a fictional World War III. At the outset, a regiment of 83 American and British soldiers, accompanied by their servant Ganga Din, are lost somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy, trying to find the right path to heaven. The name Ganga Din, we must note early on, is the title of a poem by Rudyard Kipling about a semi-fictional Hindu character who sacrificed his life for the cause of British Empire and whom Kipling celebrates as a worthy subject of Her Majesty the Queen. The poem, furthermore, 
was adapted into a major Hollywood picture in 1939 and was screened in Iran. According to a documentary film on the author's life, it is highly possible that Midrik Fendi saw this film while stationed in Tehran. <clears throat> Here I must add, before continuing with the plot summary, that Midrik Fendi's Gangadin is nothing like Kipling's. For throughout the novel, Gangadin, under the guise of a houseboy, mocks and exposes the imperial hubris and moral hypocrisy of his benefactors, wresting narrative authority from Kipling, the poet of empire, and Kipling's counterparts in Iran. Next slide, please. In fact, the British Orientalist and diplomat Robert Charles Sainer, who played a preliminary role in the coup against Mohammad Mossadegh in August 1953, relates the following about his one-time servant, Ali Midrik Fendi, echoes of which are visible in No Heaven for Gangadin. Quote, he seemed to love dirt for its own sake. He was naive, yet at the same time shrewd. He made you laugh and pretended not to understand why you were laughing, but you wondered all the time whether he was not secretly laughing at you himself, end quote. Never mind the Orientalist tone. The joke is on Robert Sainer. Next slide, please. Back to Gangadin's story, the Anglo-American regiment who are presumed the victors of, world war, of the world war between liberalism and communism, revealing Midrick Fendi's foresight to prophecy the Cold War itself, are trying to locate the path to heaven. As the regiment cross paths with a range of fantastical beings and creatures, including angels, holy judges, and the gatekeepers of heaven and hell, the story unfurls as a deceptively simple pilgrimage to salvation, a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, if I may. During all this, Gangadin, the title character, stands as a perceptive bystander on the margin of events. As Midrik Mandi tells the story of a company of lost souls who are repeatedly described in hierarchical terms, quote, with General Burke, their commander, in their front and Gangadin, their servant, in their behind, unquote. This statement recurs plenty of times throughout the narrative. The novel's central agenda is that General Burke's entourage do not necessarily deserve, but force and ultimately negotiate their way into heaven. To cut a long story short, the regiment, weary and lost in the galaxy, come across a magical being named the Wonderful Creature, who then guides them to a realm called the Holy Office. There, hosted by a round table of divine but vain deities who intervene in earthly matters, and their names are the Fate, the Rain, and the Wind Commander, the soldiers are informed that they cannot enter heaven without proper judgment. The tone here is ironic, comical, and marked with the military jargon that dominates Midrick Fendi's prose, perhaps as a result of his English education. Quote, General Burke, we read, reports to the Holy Office so that the fate commander may grant his regiment a pass to heaven. Ironically, uh, end quote, ironically, the soldiers, the self-proclaimed marchers of the war to save democracy, are terrified witless of divine judgment. And so they insist on traveling to heaven without due process and claim what they believe is rightfully theirs. The outcome is a surreal climax to the plot where the soldiers are not admitted to heaven, but decide nevertheless to occupy the jungles outside the Garden of Eden and launch a series of military campaigns against, yes, God Almighty. Following this blasphemous turn of events, Midrick Vandy's narrator turns into a war correspondent, 
and his account of this Anglo-American campaign to colonize the heaven takes on an anti-imperialist agenda. Finally, when the humans are outsourced and their war efforts exhausted, they succumb to go to the judgment field and face the music. Upon their arrival, finding one particular individual on trial who is about to be sentenced to hell for eternity, General Burke and his men finally heave a sigh of relief. For the man on trial is no one but the authoritarian leader named Devil Third, a caricature of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, the man who started World War III against the Allied forces. The Anglo-American soldiers, again, with Ganga Deen, their servant in their behind, realize that they have fought and died on the right, on the right side of history. But here is the rub. After days of interrogation, questioning, and negotiation, the holy judge grants everyone safe passage to heaven except for Ganga Deen, who is sentenced to hell alongside the devil third. It is interesting that Midrick Vandi should close his novel on such a self-effacing tone. For me, and I'm about to get theoretical, so please bear with me. Next slide, please. Midrick Vandi complicates the title of his novel, No Heaven for Ganga Deen, as either the divine denial of the protagonist's path to redemption, or as I see it, a thorough rejection of the notion of Judeo-Christian heaven as the embodiment of the colonial gaze, and by extension, the post-colonial design of modernity in the actual aftermath of the Second World War in Iran. In other words, should heaven symbolize the world order of Western hegemony, over its post-colonial peripheries, then Midrick Van Dee's rejection of and Ganga Deen's exclusion from that space is a call for an alternative map of the world. One that is playful and polyglots, self-effacing and self-reflective, decentered and decolonial. Next slide, please. Thank you. In science fiction circuits of the South and East, the title of a book, Banerjee and Fritsch argue, Fritsch argue that the worlding of science fiction, along with the manipulation of its world, should be a threefold effort. One, to historicize new archives from outside the core of Western modernity, what I've been trying to do, say, in this presentation. Two, to revisit subversive voices within the Euro-American court itself. And thirdly, quote, to illuminate the complexity of relations among the peripheries of science fiction insofar as they were always already hyper aware of and deeply imbricated in the idioms of global modernity, unquote. The modern nation state of Iran has been formed at the crossroads of global empires. From the Anglo-American great game of the 19th century to the allied occupation of the country in 1941, the US neo-imperial presence during the Cold War and currently an Islamist post-revolutionary condition of coloniality that I believe continues to essentialize the West at the center of its imagined geography. Midrick Vandi, the migrant laborer who as a victim of such crushing historical forces escapes the famine of one world war only to find himself in the clutches of another has in his work dramatized the interplay between the colonial past, post-colonial present and decolonial future of his homeland. Through his speculations over the global impact of yet another world war, Possibly in the 21st century, Midrick van Dizas inspires his reader to tackle the geopolitical and environmental challenges that we face as a result of both domestic tyranny 
and global inequalities at the heart of the discourse of Western modernity. Next slide, please. Characteristic of the future historicity or narrative speculations in No Heaven for Gangadin is, quote, an other order of thinking, which paves the way for a recasting of the intellect and imagination beyond what Walter Mignolo terms the colonial matrix of power, namely the historical conditions through which the modern discourses of nationalism, socialism, and Islamism have materialized in modern Iran. I therefore suggest that Midrik Bandi differs from his contemporary and currently canonical authors who from the 1940s to the 1970s wrote historical novels that functioned as distinctly national allegories in the Jamesonian sense of the term. Yet, Midrik Vandi, who wrote, published, and died in total obscurity, imagined a world in English, which in its broken language neither legitimizes the hegemony of global English, nor does it essentialize a nativist purchase on Iranianness, as did some of his contemporaries. My claim, echoed in the title of this talk, is that such narrative innovativeness lending itself to a decolonial paradigm shift is possible only, and in the context of contemporary Iran, only in speculative fiction. Next slide, please. Allow me to elaborate by way of an example from the text. There is an iconic passage towards the end of the novel. Uh, following the divine judgment when Ganga Din is about to be taken to hell. And I'm quoting. And as the hell plane was about to fly away, the narrator relates, Ganga Din shouted with a loud voice saying, you have made a great mistake in your judging. I am Ganga Din the carrier. End of quote. Midrak Vandi's character here is referring to, next slide please, the original Gangadin in Rudyard Kipling's poem about the regimental Bisti or water carrier who sacrificed his life for the British during an anti-colonial conflict in India. In this poem, Kipling is especially enamored of Gangadin because, and I suggest we read some stanzas from the poem, because I shan't forget the night when I dropped behind the fight with a bullet before my belt plate should have been. I was choking mad with thirst. And the man that spied me first was our good old grinning, grunting Gunga Din. He lifted up my head and he plugged me where I bled. And he gave me half a pint of water green. He carried me away to where a dooley lay. And a bullet came, come and drilled the beggar clean. He put me safe inside, safe inside, and just before he died, I hope you liked your drink, says Ganga Din. Yes, din, 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 you Lazarusian leather, Ganga Din. Though I've belted you and flayed you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Ganga Din. And I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, read uh, you know, from Kipling's Cockney accent, <laughs> the original. Uh, so the reverential, the reverential, if rapidly racist tone of Kipling towards his white man's burden is evident in this poem. Not simply because Ganga Din has saved the life of the persona, but because he has been a true servant of the British Empire, having become a native informer in a colonial war. This is not the case with Midrik van Dies Gangadin, for after he shouts, I am Gangadin the carrier as a final plea for redemption, the holy judge declares, no, you are not Gangadin the carrier. Gangadin the carrier was an Indian man. He's now up there in heaven and he's very happy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Midrik van Dies therefore is drawing the line as clearly as he can between Kipling's burden and his own responsibility, claiming in other words, that he prefers hell 
over the heaven that Kipling has sent his character to. In the end, once the holy judge makes sure and Midrick Randi confirms that our Gangadin belongs in hell, the novel abruptly ends with no further development. But from a decolonial perspective, borrowing words from Walter Mignolo, I believe that given the geopolitical, environmental, and at the time, at the present time, pandemic challenges in our world today, Midrick Van Lee's characterization of Gangadin is a radical shift in focus. Not to quote recognition or be included, you know, at the holy or imperial metropole, but to shift the focus from the one to the many, from a universal option to pluriversal options, end quote. Parallel to Mignolo's relational ontology here and relevant to my reading of Midrick Fandi's resolution to the plot, you know, no heaven for Ganga Din, is also what Julieta Singh describes as reading as a practice of unmasterful vulnerability. In her critique of the catastrophic consequences of Western industrial modernity, from colonialism and slavery to the climate crisis today, Singh provides an alternative which, to my mind, bears a strong, a striking resemblance to the narrative rejection of heaven for Ganga Din. In her book called Unthinking Mastery, Singh expresses concern over the unintended consequences of the Hegelian conception of mastery in post-Enlightenment Europe, namely sexism, racism, and speciesism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and global warming. Again, in words that echo Midrick Van Lee's choice of being an autonomous storyteller in hell, rather than a resident of the status quo in heaven, Singh argues that vulnerable reading can move us beyond mastery, not in the sense of exceeding it, but in the sense of surviving it in order to envision being, an other, being otherwise in and for the world. Perhaps driven by his own aesthetics of vulnerability in the face of domestic, global, and in his novel, Cosmic Challenges, Midrick Van Dee died in poverty and obscurity in Khoramabad in 1964, one year before the publication and global success of his novel. Next slide, please. Back in my classroom in Shiraz, I often accompany my lectures on No Heaven for Gangadin with the story of its circulation. The copy of the novel available in our campus, on our campus, was a gift of Iranian oil operating companies in 1972, Asia Institute, founded in the US and active in Pahlavi, now Shiraz University, from 1966 to 1979. Since the Islamic revolution, the book has remained cataloged in a collection named after Arthur Pope, the American Orientalist and head of the Asia Institute until 1952. When the reader finally opens the book, uh, she first reads a foreword by the British Orientalist Robert Sainer before an introduction from John Hemming, the well-meaning British soldier who saw to the book's publication in London. No Heaven for Gangadin is the modern colonial history of Iran writ large from a vulnerable and bravely speculative perspective. And I hope that my students and future readers check out the book from their libraries. And when they do it, they get to feel the weight of history carried between its covers conceive what Edward Said described as the wordliness of the text on the shelf and, uh, and grasp the subversive significance of uh, the, the, that it conveys to the reader across time and space. Such is the brand of literary scholarship that I hope to bring home to my students in search of the decolonial options available to us and our precarious lives on this fragile planet. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Amirjan, for your uh, very interesting and also greatly insightful talk. Um, I think uh, we have received some questions upon people's registration for your talks. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I think Sophie is actually uh, posting them in the chat box, if you don't mind answering some of those questions. And then if we oh, thank have you, questions those present by the attendees, then thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Mustafa John. Uh, so we shall go to the questions. The first one is, what are some of the contemporary literary works uh, similar to No Heaven for Gangadin? Can the series, The Good Place, oh yeah, then be inspired by this story? It's a very interesting question. Uh, now, I believe that science fiction has been on the rise in the Middle East region. Uh, and I can think of perhaps the Iraqi novel by, I mean, I mean Iraqi fiction in general uh, after 2003. And I can think of one interesting text by Ahmad Saadavi called Frankenstein in Baghdad. It's a work of science fiction, which, uh, which sort of revisits and, 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 and appropriates in a sense, Mary Shelley's uh, famous novel, Frankenstein. Uh, as for literature, now, if, if in the question you were referring to literature in English in Iran, I believe that at the moment, the medium is dominated by uh, diasporic uh, memoirs and novels and poetry collections that are mostly written and published outside Iran. And about the last part of the question, which, is, which I think is really interesting about the TV series, The Good Place, the subject uh, was raised in one of my classrooms as well. Uh, similarities with The Good Place, the NBC series is, well, eerie <laughs> in a sense, I think. And I have, and honestly, I haven't researched uh, this possible link, but, uh, but maybe, you know, it might, be, uh, it might be worth a lawsuit for NBC. <laughs> Just kidding, but, uh, uh, but, but thank you. Then uh, is there another question, Sophie? So how was the movement away from Western? Uh, oh yeah, how has the movement away from Western uh, colonial notion of modernity affected Persian literature, especially since the revolution? How do you see the future of Iran's speculative fiction? Uh, now, if by post-revolutionary literature, we mean the literature of the socialist realist movements, you know, uh, sponsored by the government. And I would assume that the terrain has not been thoroughly decolonized, which unfortunately has further, you know, essentialized, uh, essentialized the existing uh, global hierarchies and the binary oppositions uh, between East and the West. Uh, as, for, as for the future of speculative fiction in Iran, well, I honestly couldn't predict the future of the genre, but uh, especially after the revolution, but you know, uh, I think I also mentioned the two titles in my own talk. One is uh, is Qulam Hussein Sanatizadeh's Rostam in the 22nd century, uh, which more than No Heaven for Gangadin adheres to uh, the standards of a science fiction work, and also some of Sadaq Hedayat's short stories. Uh, and uh, all right, thank you. This, 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 this is what I can uh, respond to this question. Is there another one? Uh, so how would you say colonialism shaped Iranian discourse? This is a very general question, but I would say, again, in very general terms, in every possible way. Uh, first, firstly, we need to go beyond the common assertion that Iran was never formally colonized in the sense that regional neighbors like India were. Uh, once this paradigm shift occurs in Iranian thought, I believe that it's, it will be possible then to make a case for, uh, for the encounter with modernity as a colonial encounter in Iranian history. Now, I do not embrace, I, I tend not to embrace the term uh, which is now common in, in Iranian studies called colonial modernity. But I would, you know, following uh, the decolonial the theories uh, of Latin America, perceive modernity, coloniality as two sides of the same coin. Uh, so, and, and from this perspective, I believe that every aspect of life uh, since the advent of Tajadot, as I mentioned in the talk in terms of nationalism, 
socialism and Islamism uh, might be understood uh, from a post-colonial perspective. Yes. How would you say colonialism? Oh, all right, it's number four. Or what are the intersections between the decolonial option and colonial modernity vis-a-vis -vis Iran's view of the world? Uh, thanks for this question. Now, if, if, if by Iran's view of the world, uh, we have the so-called uh, Western modernity, uh, the, the perception of Western modernity in Iran, then I think that the current view is polarized being either anti-Western or Westernized, being either Westoxicated or, uh, you know, uh, the other uh, uh, extreme end of the spectrum. So I think the solution is a mode of thought uh, and more importantly, a mode of reading, a mode of reading that decenters our, uh, our worldviews and our imagined geography, so to speak, without necessarily having to compromise our politics. Uh, and you know, and the good thing, and the good thing I believe is that uh, we do have uh, remnants of such pa critical paradigm shift uh, in place, not just in critical theory, but perhaps also in Iranian studies. Uh, I can, for instance, think of uh, critiques of the colonial matrix of power done extensively in the context of Latin America, I can think of the critical humanism of Edward Said or in Iranian studies, I think what Hamid Dabashi refers to as new organicity uh, is a very interesting solution to, uh, to this polarized uh, perception of the West uh, in Iranian intellectual history. Yeah, thank you. What are the responses of Iranian anti-colonial thinkers to contemporary expressions of Indian nationalism? Unfortunately, this question falls outside the scope of my expertise, uh, but as a, as a West Asian observer, you know, I am following the events unfolding in India uh, very closely. And I believe that the brand of Hindu nationalism that is promoted by the BJP and Narendra Modi is, is, it might be very similar to, to a future scenario in Iran, where, for instance, a conception of secular nationalism or, or Aryanism or whatever is integrated into global economy. Uh, sadly, you know, I, I cannot answer uh, this question from a uh, from an informed perspective, but, but it, this is an interesting link for research, I believe. Thank you. What's the role of the so-called broken and outsider language of the author in establishing the mood of this narrative work? As I noted in my presentation, uh, the language you know, adds a sense of otherness and alterity to the narrative uh, that is, uh, that, that distinguishes the tone uh, from, the, from other dominant variations of global English. Uh, now, I should perhaps correct myself, you know, for the use of the term broken in my own presentation, uh, for I do not necessarily think that the language employed by Mitra Kandi is syntactically flawed. Uh, I, think, I think more than being broken, the English that Midrick Van D uses in the novel, and I encourage everyone to read the novel, is concrete, you know, con in the biblical sense of the word, as, uh, as suggested by George Orwell uh, in his essay, Politics and the English Language. And in that sense, you know, this concreteness contributes to the subversiveness of the narrative, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, all right, we have another question. Did you make a change in your syllabi following the discovery of the novel to teach in class? And if so, how do your students currently living in the APE Center react to it? Yes, yes, Parisa. In fact, in fact, I have been teaching this novel uh, from the semester immediately after that epiphany that I had and I talked about in my presentation. And I have been teaching it in my postgraduate seminars and undergraduate seminars, and students are absolutely 
are thrilled with the way the text uh, addresses some very relevant issues, you know, to their own concerns. Because the thing is that uh, the, uh, the curricula of English literary studies in Iran, uh, as I mentioned, is, uh, has so far and currently is predominantly Eurocentric, uh, focusing, focusing primarily on, on, uh, on white European and American, uh, but, but mostly British authors. So, so suddenly introducing a blend of uh, literature in English, not literature in English from the Commonwealth, but from Iranian literature is absolutely fascinating for me as a teacher and, I, and hopefully for my students. Uh, I'll write a question from Nirufar. What are the ethnic and Iranian cultural characteristics and stories the author brings to his story? Is the character Gangadin in any way related to the character uh, Sia in our traditional theater or Sia Farzi? Uh, I'm not sure about the last part of your question, Nilufar, but uh, but as for the first part, again, in No Heaven for Gangadin, I believe that uh, there are very few references to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, ethnic backgrounds of the author, but in the unpublished manuscript that I mentioned, uh, uh, and, if, uh, uh, and if you happen to be around Oxford, the manuscript is in the Bodleian Library, uh, in that epic, there are references to some to some ethnic folklores, and uh, uh, and that should be a, a very interesting, you know, uh, research research project and field of inquiry for for uh, a future project. All right, uh, shall I shall I continue, Mustafa John, or is there? Uh, you know what we would we would definitely love to hear more and more and more. <laughs> I'm sorry. Fascinating. No, but at the same time, I I also wanted. Well, thank you so much. I wanted to again thank you for accepting our invitation and for this very intriguing and insightful talk. Um, I wanted to also thank everyone who joined us today and want to let them know that as uh, per the last the slide, if uh, you can show this, there you go. Amirjan is happy to be contacted by email. Uh, should you have any other questions or should you want to share your ideas with him regarding his talk? Uh, and we would also love to hear your feedback. Uh, there's going to be a very short survey and Sophie will kindly post a link to this uh, in the chat box. There you go. It's, it's already there. We would really appreciate if you can take a couple of minutes to answer that. Uh, and also I wanted to invite you, all of you warmly to um, our next lecture, which is going to be held on Saturday, October 31st uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, again, uh, today's lecture was an anomaly in terms of the timing, uh, but all other lectures um, uh, are going to be at 4 p.m. PST. And our next lecture, which is going to be uh, rendered by Dr. Behrang uh, 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 is titled The Poetics and Politics of Representation a comparative study of Seymour in four royal manuscripts of the Shahnameh. Uh, and you can find the RSVP link at asia.ubc.ca. Once again, thank you everyone. And um, um, thanks to the team that helped us, Sophie, Connie, uh, Ann, uh, and Darius, who uh, provided the closed caption. And thanks again to Amirjan. Uh, all of you have a wonderful uh, rest of your day or night. Thanks. Bye.